changes this morning to the schedule that I'd like to uh, make note of right quick. Uh, on your schedule, there aren't any room numbers that's printed, but if you look in the uh, first column there, um, the rooms are A, second column is B, third column is C. So the rooms are labeled A, B, and C. So uh, the first change is that the labor will move to the 1030 under A, and the social will move to 2.30 under B, all right? So if anybody have any questions, see me or uh, Cindy. Uh, she can help you address those issues. The people movement is going up. And, yes, yes, the people movement assembly is moving up to uh, 10.30 at B. Uh, for the plenary this morning, plenary uh, is uh, reports from the front line of oppression. On the end, we have... Uh, Rhea Chapman from Sister Song. We have Robin Benson, Benton from Black Lives Matter Asheville. We have Alita Austin Ture, New Jim Crow Movement, and also Jacksonville 19. And also we have George Friday with, she just changed, uh, well, okay, we moved to a men. Okay, so that's our panel. And um, we'll let them start. Am I start? Okay, I'll take it. Oh, okay. I'm going to take it off because I'll have to pass it down. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I actually don't trust that I need this because I talk plenty loud. Y'all can hear me fine? Okay, I'll do this because, you know, sometimes people with gray hair don't say that they're, they have hearing <laughs> issues. I'm not trying to call anybody out, so I will use it. Why do you think I'm sitting up front? <laughs> okay, there you go. Claim it, brother. That's a good thing. So I'm George Friday. I live in Gastonia, North Carolina, and um, I am one of the, I'm blessed to be one of the founding members of Move to Amend. I'm on the leadership team of Move to Amend. I also work with the Bill of Rights Defense Committee and the Defending Dissent Foundation. That's a joint, newly merged organization. I want to um, say that for the, at least the last 15 years, I have not been on the front lines of struggle. Um, I would describe what I do as being an intermediary. I work with and support organizers and movement building. I'd say what I've been doing for the past 15, close to 20 years, I would describe as movement building. Um, but prior to that, for 25 years, I was definitely on the front lines of struggle. Um, and after the young woman spoke, Janelle, yeah, I remember. Um, it reminded me a little bit of uh, some of the choices that I made young, it, it, when I was younger in my own life. I, um, I went to school at UNC Chapel Hill, and I was very excited about um, studying political science then. I grew up in a low-income neighborhood. 
I would not describe my parents as poor because poor means deficit. And just because you lack income does not mean you lack resources, commitment, initiative, brilliance. So I didn't grow up in poverty. My family is and was low income. But I also felt like the solution was political. After a short time at UNC, I could see that that wasn't the answer. Politics wouldn't work. And certainly, at the time, the political parties that I saw were going to help. So then I added economics to my bundle of things I would major in. Y'all, I had never been madder in my lesson life. I remember sitting in a class and realizing that money wasn't anything. A bunch of people decided to work for money, and the people who decided what money was worth were rich. Oh, man, I was hot and stuff, and helped me think mm, uh, in a scientific way about what was going on. But it just pissed me off. It continued to, and still pisses me off. But luckily, God loves me, and I got um, African American studies to do honors in. And that, you know, that helped everything make more sense. You just read a little Langston Hughes, hang out a little while with, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, and all will be well. So I wanted to just share that because it gives you a little bit about me, but not too long. It didn't take too long, hopefully. Um, and. These days, when I when I am I'm sharing what comes from the grassroots folks that I work with and what I see, and a lot of that's my own analysis, the analysis that comes from Move to Amend and from the Bill of Rights Defense Committee and the Defending Dissent Foundation. And for the most part, we it, through my work work, what supposedly keeps the light on most of the time keeps the lights on, is the work that is looking at what are supposed to be our constitutionally protected activities, like free speech yes. and free association, yes. which are being really, ex at an a accelerating rate, being threatened. And it's pretty scary stuff. So I'm going to say the F word. And I want to encourage y'all to get comfortable saying the F word, because that's where we are. Fascism. I said it. I'll say it again. And um, wow, this is the first time I've gotten that reaction. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mentioned it to some to someone a weekend or so ago when I was in the D.C. area, and she said, "This was a." And I'm, I'm not trying to be rude about this, but this was a white progressive person. And I do, I do, in my experience, and I've known white folks my whole life. <laughs> My neighbors growing up, also poor. But the, the, from my experience, white folks, the lens is different than my lens. My lens, not our lens. I ain't speaking for nobody but George. But she said when she heard fascism, she thinks about Hitler. When I hear fascism, I remember in the 70s, my parents telling me, don't you go outside after 11 o'clock, because you know you'll get stopped. And this was me. Now, if you were male, you not only gonna get stopped, you might get killed. And now, it's even more of a threat. And I have a 21-year-old in my life who I love and nurtured and brought up. I want him to be fine. If, if it's the weekend and I hadn't had a text from him in several hours, and it's like two or three in the morning, I wanna know he's okay. That is not the kind of life we need to be living. That is not we the people and you know pursue our health and wealth and happiness and all that stuff that was supposedly supposed to be our country. So in my work, the increased militarization of the <coughs> local police, yeah. right, is, is one threat that we can challenge. The increasing surveillance of all of us. So in the 70s, it felt like, from my experience, that the, this is a very crude way of putting things. I'm so sorry I'm being taped because later on I'll go, God, George, you could have done a better job there. But it <laughs> felt like the, um, target was on black folks and mostly black men. And that was true then. I even pushed it. I lived in DC. I did way illegal things in front of the police. They just ignored me. But my brothers came to visit, just walked to the corner store, got stopped on the way there and on the way back. So that proved to me, oh yeah, it is about gender, black and male. So that's real. But now the, the, there is a goal to put the target on all of us so that we are intimidated, so that our encouragement to use our rights is chilled, so that our speech is, so what we say is chilled, so that we're not going to say something bold and loud and public. I do know through my work 
that there is an increased threat to um, entrap and to infiltrate groups like Black Lives Matter. That's how Occupy was taken down, if y'all don't know, because of infiltration and entrapment. And now Black Lives Matter is on the chopping block. And law enforcement agencies and federal agencies are scheming about how can we get them. So it's something to look out for, especially infiltration. But of course, that's also one, one way to break up our power. If we look it over our shoulders and say, what's she doing? Where's she from? That's not helping us either. So I, I share that part of what we need to do creative solutions around is the growing fascism, infiltration, entrapment among us. I think part of the solution is building strong community, which has also, I'm proud to say, one of my life lessons and life practices. I noticed that when I was 7 and 10 and 11 that my neighbor, who, who were poor white folks, and my parents would exchange what they needed through the back door yeah. because they couldn't do it on the front steps. In Lincolnton, North Carolina, where the Klan would march every year, white folks couldn't have alliances with black folks publicly. <laughs> But if they needed shortening and we needed flour, they would go back and forth to on each other's porches. And on Saturday night, they'd sit back there and, you know, drink PBR and talk junk. And it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> but come time I was in junior high school and we'd moved to Gastonia by that point, the alliances my family had with low-income white folks looked different. And it was only my dad who drove a tractor trailer truck and had his redneck friends who had the... I don't know what the word is, but had the space in his life to maintain a um, less than economical relationship with white folks. But for us, and, and in those settings, they didn't, my parents didn't actively challenge the racism that was there. Because racism is in the room. If you're white, you grew up in this country, there's racism you gotta deal with. And it's, it's your, your job or our job to identify and I think in one of the um, rules that Malefi talked about, he said, be conscious of your privilege. That's where it starts. What kind of privilege do you carry? You know, you're a US citizen. You went to college. You got white skin. You got a penis. You, um, are, you can pass for Christian if you're Christian. Or you're heterosexual. Or all of the ways that you don't draw, that you aren't in trouble in this society. And most of those are diminishing. And I've pushed off as many of them as I can most of my life, and I'll continue to do that because there's something in my brain that thinks if somebody out here is pushing on the jumping up and down on the left side of things, it kind of shifts everybody a little bit more to the left. Not that the left is the answer, but the right sure isn't either. Um, so I, I don't want to take a whole lot of time. I just want to encourage us to get comfortable using fascism and saying it with other people and helping them realize that we're not talking about um, you know, uh, armed people in the streets yet, but they're training. <laughs> they are training. You can look for up something called Urban Shield to find out where and when they're training. And um, my friend David Cobb says it's a kinder, gentler fascism. I don't experience any of it as gentle when there are black and brown bodies in the street. And there's a way that I think we're supposed to become comfortable with that. In the same way that I think we were supposed to be, after decades of surveillance on black communities, that we're supposed to be comfortable enough now that, oh yeah, we just know that's, that's just the new normal, to challenge the new normal, to be solution driven, and to put practices in your regular daily life that conjure joy, imagination, and vision so that the constant barrage of bullshit, yes I said it, does not get you so in, infuriated, um, de-energized, because if you, if you spend too much time, not that these, these issues don't require some attention, you know, reading this and getting analysis, all that good stuff. In my experience, though, after we do a bunch of analysis, I'm too tired to come up with a solution. I'm all bummed out, I want a glass of wine, and I just want to sleep. <laughs> so my encouragement to you is while you have some great energy, maybe in the morning, or after prayers, or after hearing a great song, or after a run, then imagine what's our solution. And you don't even have to use too much intellectual power. If you're a person of faith, you can just say, okay, God, goddess, Buddha, you know, Krishna, come on, show me what we need, and there can fuel your energy. I promise, it can work. So hang in there. 
Um, see you in the People's Movement Assembly workshop later, and have a great day. from the front lines of oppression. I want to uh, put another word out there. I like how she started this. She said fascism. I want to say uh, imperialism, <laughs> capitalism, sexism, and an old one um, that's coming back a lot because of the nonprofit industrial complex classes. Yes. Um, so in that, you know, our front lines where I am in Florida right now um, has a lot to do with you know what's happening in the factor, the three pieces that most people know of the work we're doing in the new Jim Crow movement uh, is dealing with the uh, state of repression. Um, it's dealing with uh, people like Angela Corey, the district attorney who could not convict Zimmerman, who could not, didn't want to put away Dunn for uh, the death of Jordan Davis and who uh, gave, wanted to give Marissa 60 years for standing her ground as a woman. So, you know, those are the three battles that we've had that most people know of. But, you know, in actuality, I believe, you know, when we look at the reports from the front lines of oppression, one of the things that I think when I'm, you know, in dealing with that in regards to imperialism is another factor of um, the growth that we still need to reflect on in how I see a lot of the things that are still the same when I was in my mother's belly. And, um, you know, my mom, if you, you know a little bit about why I do this and why I believe the passion had to come, it had to do with my birthright, my mother in 68, you know, uh, with her party, having to, just like everyone else, upset at what happened to MLK, right, the day I was, the year I was born, going out, doing what we had to do in the streets, making noise, the riots that came about, she was at Northeastern Radio Station, and she spoke out against it with her party. But the um, factor was, of course, just like now, they always have something to do against us. I'm talking about police brutality. I'm talking about the systems that incarcerated, that killed. You know, a part of this is about my brothers and sisters incarcerated, talking about political prisoners, never allowing them to ever be forgotten. Those are prisoners of war. You know, so when my mom was grabbed by her afro, right, pregnant with me, bully club by six cops with pregnant with me and her party being put in jail that day. She was a young person like I am. Well, no, I'm 47, she was in her 20s. Hmm. Um, the truth is, you know, from that day, that was my birthright. So there is a place because of this movement. I'm still a young person, and I'm not. The youth that I'm working with, I want to acknowledge the little boy that's in the room. Where is he? Is he still here? He, he stepped out. Okay, I'll acknowledge him later. But it's important to remember um, you know, I'm still having this dialogue because my elders are my elders, but I'm no longer the young person. We've got to build from the birth, I mean from that belly, that our young people have to be in leadership. And I appreciate the young lady from the millennium, you know, it, those are the ones, even myself, stepping aside. I'm 47, I'm stepping aside. So with Black Lives Matter, in the movement, it means a certain thing that we have to remember that there were those in our civil rights and human rights uh, fights and struggle that have said to my young person, and I must make the statement, well, you were too young to be around there. You had nothing to do. You don't know nothing about. So what that says to me, and you know, it, I'm looking at that uh, piece that he told us to look at back as far as our rules, you know, when we talk about not calling out the individual organization's scope of objective and principles and criticism, but saying it in a way to reflect. And I think criticism is good, and that's where I think accountability happens. And we need more criticism. So, you know, in that respect, when I hear people say that to my youth, and I'm talking about my son, 13, you know, my 15-year-old, and all the youth in my program, it's not okay that we don't push a word called adultism. You know, if they weren't in the movement and they hadn't known about it, maybe that was our fault. We can't blame the schools no more, can we? We can't blame that our elders maybe haven't taught them. And we are our elders to connect with these youth who are on Facebook, who are on Instagram, who's on another one, what's my daughter call it, Kick. You know, they're on Kick until 4 o'clock in the morning sometimes. You know how I found out? In the summertime, I let my daughter have her phone all throughout the night. You know, during the school year, the whole friends are on that phone until 3 o'clock in the morning. Is it supervised? Are they learning about what we need them to know about human rights? Are they learning about civil rights? 
What do you think they're talking about? So there's a, a place we haven't tapped into. And if we keep saying you haven't been here, you don't know, instead of let me take you on. Let me be your leadership. You know, those people that who knocked my mom in her head because she now has dementia, right? I was ready to come back to them back when I was in college in Boston to find those police officers in the place of doing what I needed to do. You know, there's a place, and I think, um, Sister uh, Afia, you know, yeah, we used, there was a backbone that people had in what we protect, how we protected each other. You know, and there is a, a numbing now of not, of complacency that we, even us as the organizer and activists have not stood up for each other. I'm gonna say that again. There is actually a complacency and also a place where we do not stand up for each other where it was important, you know, and Pam Africa said there was a group of folks, you know, just like uh, uh, when they talk about, I know why the cage birds sing, <laughs> Maya said, yeah, my uncles came out and stood up for us when a woman was beat down. You know, that is movement work. You know, writing the petitions, getting this work done, doing the 198 actions, as War Resister says, is important, but it's also in that direct next door neighbor, as we say, getting to know each other and being there for each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I think of that, I think for me, um, that is my place now as an elder slash in between young person still at 47. Um, yeah, I'm still young and have energy, but my youth, are the youth that need to be the spokesperson, that need to be the organizers, that need to know every position if it had to be, that we rotate, who needs to know the grant writing next, who needs to do the emails, because all the people I work with mostly only do the Facebook on their phone, who is it that is not getting the information because we don't have it like the Immokalee workers sometimes in a comic book strip, because not everyone's reading. There's a lot of places that we still need to look back, but we have to think out the box of what the premises was for organizing and look to these young people who can tell us some things. My 13-year-old is the one that shows me when I have an event page why I ain't getting the most folks coming to the event page, why my Indigo page ain't responding right. We've got that whole trip as far as what's happening with new technology, but there are also those who will tell us and we need to listen to them why was it that the Facebook page in uh, Egypt came about and they were able to get Mubarak out, right? But they didn't have paper like we have. And someone says, well, you need to have nonprofit money and you need to have uh, paper, but there's a, a different notion when we look at our uh, people that they say third world, right? And I'm saying those I need to look out and how they're internationally and globally are doing this work, they don't need that. When the call was to go to Mexico City, the people in the Mexico rural areas dropped their rakes and went down to Mexico City. They didn't have the constraints of the nine to five. And what I'm saying is, yes, this nonprofit piece means, yes, we have those in classism in our movement that think it's all about money, and you need to have that, and that's how our movement can be stronger. I say the grassroots need to remember, and we need to remember that it's not about what you have, it's about our people power and bringing up those mem um, members within our communities, despite how much you have. Is it that we haven't been able to work after hours until 3 o'clock or whatever it takes? And I, I saw how they planned this, so I know they're doing it, you know, and plan putting this together. It's going outside of that. And reminding our youth, yes, going to college is important, and even going into social action, but Black Lives Matter has shown me, oh, they're working in the hours, late at night, and with technology. So there's a realm where I, I acknowledge the millennialism, but also the young boy, and hopefully if he comes back in the room, acknowledging him. And then, you know, saying, like I said, my mom was the elder for me. You know, even despite I had to live with my grandmother and go to ch church six days a week, because they didn't want to be like her. They wanted me to be like her because she dropped out of college and started in the movement. Um, but instead, that reminded me that you cannot allow our young people to forget you know, a lot of us um, are, um, may not have seen the same. If we look around the room, some people that were in the movement with us aren't around anymore. They got good jobs, whatever the reasons, you know, or they have a place right now, like a lot of folks in Ferguson, they don't have maybe housing. They have taken it into a tent outside of a little tent city, and they, they've sacrificed it all, right? So there's different realms on how many are in this room can travel, 
can be here even as youth, <clears throat> that we have to acknowledge that. Uh, and I believe in our movement right now, we're looking outside of the box. What do we need to do? There is a seventh plan, um, you know, seventh generational planning. There's a whole piece on Octavia Butler's pair above the sword right now. You know, and I'm in that discussion with them. Why? That's movement work also. That's human rights. That's acknowledging we are human. And, and what that means is that Dr. Talk, talking about intentional communities, which we're thinking about, you know, that 198 um, um, ways to direct actions is we're looking at that more closely. We're trying to keep and connect with writing more often. How often do we write our political prisoners? You know? Yes. In this struggle right now, Change.com is putting on their Facebook, get in touch with Mamiya. Get in touch with what's happening with his health. Where is Imam Jamil? Have we reported on that? Right? That is where we, every single one of us, may have a young person in a school, a community center, or in our front lines that we should be making sure once a month they're writing them. That's what I was doing when I was in my teens, you know, is writing our, our political prisoners. Do they even know all of them? Um, and I know if Fia may have some of those pictures up there, I see one on the wall, <laughs> if you don't know them all, because they are our link to that Sankofa we talked about in the, in the morning, to know where we're coming, where we, what happened to us. And those young people on the front line want to know, man, I'm right now on probation, right? I've got 100 community um, hours. I'm approaching for six, uh, probation for six months, although uh, 19 of us have mostly a year. I'm paying a thousand dollars to state of Florida for retribution. Uh, res what is it called? Restitution. Yeah. Retribution. Yeah. Um, I'm paying another thousand dollars to the courts. Now remember, our courthouse is 350 million dollars bigger than Smithsonian, right? Mm. And I'm paying another fee to the uh, to the to the city, you know, because of Black Lives Matter. Because of Michael Brown and, and, um, and Eric Garner, we took the bridge, right? So in that piece, with what they're doing, do we have to let them know that we're going to leave them around like we're doing with our political prisoners, not pay attention to them? Are we going to do that for Black Lives Matter? we got to let them know, no, we got your back. We are there. And, and that's the questions that my youth and my communities are asking. They may not have read all the books and, and haven't been in all the political education classes yet, we're teaching university sentinels and um, doing popular educational pieces, you know. But the truth of the matter is, they want to know. Now that we're ready, and we heard you all always say we haven't been available to be in the movement. We weren't doing it, right? That's the pull your straps up by your little straps piece, right? <laughs> and so instead, we are showing them we are going to be there. And that's why Mami is important. We all are connected to him. We're writing him. We're sending money into him, just like every political prisoner. But we got to keep doing that piece. Um, so in this, um, you know, in our front lines of the oppression, we are dealing with that as well as the fact that I'm glad to hear that a lot more of the women and of the LGBT, because they're the ones that started the uh, Black Lives Matter. It was three lesbian women that started that movement, acknowledging, yes, it's about um, the men. It's about Trayvon. I have a son, right? But I also have a daughter. You know, and in acknowledging that, her having to do maybe some, some of the things my mom would say they did in the 60s in the movement, she's not going to have to because I don't. You know, and so that patriarchy is another part of that imperialism, is connected to that calm capitalism, <coughs> is connected to the sexism and how it's not going to be done, but we got to connect the elders with the middle person, which is me and the youth, so we can all be on the same page and then eventually have... Uh, the freedom that we want. And so I, I'm just um, just hoping that, you know, you all enjoy and we have some great solutions come out of it tomorrow. And um, I'm just um, right now just excited about what this means and um, continuing it on. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Robin Benton, and um, I'm asked to speak about uh, Black Lives Matter and my experience with Black Lives Matter in Asheville. A little background on myself. I recently, recently returned to Asheville area after 20 years. Uh, uh, I left Asheville after a meeting with the Grand Cyclops of the North Carolina Klan who had proceeded to have uh, threatened to have me killed. I published a newspaper in Asheville some years ago called Multicultural Digest. 
and had the honor of meeting the, the Grand Cyclops, as I said, of the North Carolina clan. I left the country, moved to Belize, New York City, and I'm back in Asheville. Um, I admin uh, anti-racism media on Facebook, quite a few followers there, anti-racism TV on Twitter. Prior to that, I was involved in social media with the Occupy Gathering, National Gathering, uh, as Occupy Racism. I was the thorn in Occupy's side and referencing uh, embracing racial justice issues. Um, I thought that was the greatest impediment uh, in the Occupy movement to unity and a real description of what 99% meant, really, in terms of the inclusion of people of color and the issues. Um, I came back to Asheville. I'm an organizer. Um, my focus, uh, as we speak of fascism, classism, imperialism, my focus is uh, white supremacy. And that's the elephant in the room, I guess, the uh, politically incorrect term that no one wants to really delve into. My background is with the People's Institute, with the real basic formula in terms of defining racism as race prejudice plus power. We focus on institutional, structural, systemic racism, and we delve also into the interpersonal. As far as Black Lives Matter and human rights, I've seen that movement from the beginning uh, represent, in my opinion, a human rights movement, uh, not civil rights, human rights, and herein lies the difference. Uh, we understand that uh, civil rights, uh, for any type of uh, addressing the issue, you, the, uh, the victim has to prove intent. There's an intentionality clause built into the civil rights law. And civil rights protects in housing and employment, racism, white supremacy exists in all areas of people activity. It needs to be addressed there. Um, as relates to Asheville, we're very fortunate uh, in that there's a report that came out by one of the, the uh, professors of sociology who had the mind to extract statistics and data from area, uh, various areas of people activity. We call it the state of black Asheville. For me, it's a report on disparate outcomes. Now, speaking of human rights, human rights framework and the legal uh, framework is based on disparate outcomes. If the statistics and the data says things are out of whack, then the government is compelled by law to come back into compliance. It's not arguing intentionality, are you prejudiced, uh, arguing the definitions of racism versus prejudice, it's a, it's a fact. It's human rights laws. And the United States has signed a treaty, ratified a treaty, CERD, the International Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, it's the most uh, protective law in its language, uh, uh, intersectionally. And yet the U.S. Uh, wrote something called a reservation, which is a loophole, stating, yes, while we'll agree in principle to this human rights law, we feel that our constitution and civil rights framework is more than adequate to protect our citizens. And herein lies my issue and my argument. Um, we have in North Carolina a revisiting of the voting rights issue. A lot of organizing has been done across racial lines, religious lines, to pursue that right to vote. That, to me, is a revisit of an issue that is 50 years old under a civil rights framework. Human rights is an obvious violation. The maladies that come into our headlines daily are human rights violations. And uh, there is a point where the U.S. government does not require the police departments to forward information on police killings so the data is awry. Uh, so that disparate outcome isn't official, although I would say the Guardian newspaper in England began, took the initiative to start annotating and aggregating the information on police killings. Um, so we see the government kind of side-skirting the issue of human rights. And as I said, as it's been ratified, uh, and the Constitution and civil rights is enough, more than enough for protection, we beg to differ. Similarly, we as Americans have a tendency to look at our Constitution as this Bible. 
that really elevates and protects us as humans. But in reality, the uh, Constitution does not have any social or economic rights inferred or involved in it at all. Um, human rights does. One of the four conventions is dealing with political and cultural rights. Uh, the police violence against our youth, uh, that's the convention uh, against torture, the uh, school to prison pipeline. There's 64,000 black women missing in this country. There's nearly 2,000 aboriginal women missing between Canada and the United States. Uh, we want to raise that up in the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, initiative. It's Yes, youth, but it's intergenerational. And all the effects are human rights violations. Uh, they're not civil rights violations in the same sense. Uh, so uh, we talked about uh, strategies concerning uh, human rights. Uh, as I said, Black Lives Matter in Asia, we have this spirit outcome report in all areas, uh, business, housing, education, law enforcement. It's a glaring report on the state of Black Asheville, yet it's not addressed in any political forums with any plan of action at all. It's, uh, so while Asheville is in an economic boom, you have the other segment of the population is going into a whole depopulation uh, uh, slide, and no one wants to talk about it, and that's human rights. Uh, I've spoken with uh, attorneys, both international attorneys and constitu constitutional attorneys, um, concerning uh, human rights versus civil rights, and we've come about a, a idea that's really basic, and that is municipal law, local law, is also supreme law of the land, just as the Constitution and treaties. They're all rated the same in terms of supreme law of the land. And what we have done uh, and hope to do in organizing locally is to enact human rights law into municipal law. That can be done and you automatically or immediately are now connected to the international forum uh, legally, that framework, uh, for human rights. And yet we're still pursuing civil rights and local uh, uh, law and politics when human rights should be the base. Uh, and so with the enactment of CERD, uh, there's enforcement on the international stage. And Malcolm X was uh, the visionary, and he was always also transformative in his career and life. And he recognized that we are pursuing and we're lamenting and we're celebrating civil rights, and we haven't secured our human rights. Yes. And so... Uh, the killings on, on blacks, the extrajudicial killings, um, that's based on the value of black lives not having much value. And so uh, it's not a self-esteem issue, it's just it's a factual issue that the state apparatus does not respect black lives unless they can monetize those black lives from youth to uh, prison. And you know, as we're here to uh, also move to amend 14th Amendment. Well, 13th Amendment says that slavery never ended. That's right. So, you know, human rights issue, by the way. So, you know, as we're here, I came to this uh, meeting today because I'm really fired up about the idea of organizing around human rights. And so that's the lens that I would uh, encourage uh, to look through. And uh, I also want to bring up the fact that uh, in Asheville, Black Lives Matter is organizing with Stand Up for Racial Justice, a white ally group. We're developing relationships. They're uh, on a track of accountability to communities of color. They understand that, that formula. And our intent is to bring a citywide uh, undoing racism campaign, uh, starting with training the organizers, activists, and protesters to hold those functioning within institutions as gatekeepers into an accountability relationship. And that's the end for me. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Rhea Chapman. I am a licensed clinical social worker in North and South Carolina. I'm also 
the Southern Organizer for Sister Song, the National uh, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. Uh, we are based in Atlanta, Georgia. However, I am based in Charlotte, North Carolina. So um, I'm super excited to have the opportunity to come uh, for the very first time um, to meet and, and, and uh, organize and strategize with all of you. Um, everyone has said such wonderful and um, in-depth um, things about the work that they're doing. And I was listening to everyone, and what came up for me is intersectionality, which of course, if you're familiar with the reproductive justice movement, you understand that is one of the founding principles um, in the work that we do. But it, it became very um, obvious and um, apparent to me that even though we may work in various movements, uh, we have various focuses, um, that the work that we do very much overlaps and intersects in so many different ways. And so spaces like this are so important for us to have an opportunity to come and to convene, to talk with each other, to, um, to be able to find ways to help each other, to move the movement together, right? Um, as far as the work that I do in North Carolina, where I started um, my activism um, many moons ago at... 34 years old. Um, <laughs> it seems like a long time because because the work is hard sometimes and um, self-care is so important. And so I like to say that I work at the intersection of social work and social justice work because um, as a clinical social worker, my experience and training has sort of qualified me to work within community at the micro, macro, and mental level, right, in terms of, you know, if I'm providing direct counseling mental health services to folks or if I'm working in a nonprofit capacity and helping people organize at the grassroots level. And then as an organizer, um, those same connections to community just again sort of raised up these intersectional ways that oppression is present. Um, as far I started my organizing um, in the LGBT community, so doing um, writing, presenting, publishing work about healthcare disparities specifically um, relative to the aging LGBT population uh, and with entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, um, retirement funding, how are the ways um, as as we age and you know as, as LGBT identified folks, you know, what would our life look like compared to our heterosexual counterparts? Um, I started a lot around organizing uh, young people um, and teaching them adv advocacy um, and how to be a voice for their own issues. Uh, in Charlotte, around Jonathan Farrell, people are still organizing. It's so beautiful to have been at the forefront of that work. Um, additional things that I've been working on uh, as an RJ activist is HB 465. Um, our governor, <laughs> uh, he's special, special governor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's so special. We're going to pray for him. Um, but <laughs> right. um, so in terms of obviously being very passionate about uh, <coughs> women's rights, women's reproductive health, um, reproductive justice is different from reproductive rights and different from reproductive health. And so I'll talk more about that um, in the social justice forum later. I won't get into that today. but. Um, doing some advocacy uh, around that, as well as billboard campaigns. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that um, some billboards popped up in Charlotte and other areas of North Carolina. We really um, did some amazing work across Georgia and across the South, um, even in Tennessee, uh, with making sure that these billboards that were popping up um, really targeting uh, women of color in low-income communities um, sort of uh, manipulating them into crisis pregnancy centers and keeping children and talking about um, the psychological and emotional impact that that has on a woman who's already having to make those types of decisions for herself and then to um, attack her, you know, coming out of uh, reproductive health care choices she needs to make for herself. So doing a lot of work around that. Um, we, Sister Song has also been very active alongside Black Lives Matter. We were at the convening. Um, I organized alongside some other uh, organizers in Charlotte around Black Lives Matter as well, and so continuing to lift that movement up. Um, one of the things that is really important um, as we come up with solutions that I like to see come out of chronic is um, strategy before visibility, right? Because 
though we say things like we cannot blame our elders for um, our lack of um, <coughs> engagement in movement building, I think there is a responsibility to the elders to pass on to those of us who are younger in the movement what worked. Because the reality is, is that the elders that we still have survived. Right? Does that, does that come across that the elders that we have still with us survived the times when Malcolm X's and Martin Luther King's and Emmett's Hills, they didn't make it to this side. And so because you're still here with us and you hold those jewels, that's going to help us as the millennials. I'm still being a millennial at 34. I don't care about the 33 situation. I'm still... I have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I don't even know what that is. Tumblr. I guess. Is that old? It's after. Okay. Um, anyway, so I'm really excited uh, to be here. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I wrote on this paper that I'm not going to talk about because I really don't like talking that much, and I guess I kind of have to because I'm here. But um, also, the last thing I'll leave with you is um, one of the most important pieces of my work. Again, um, everything that I do is an uh, intersection of reproductive justice, which is why I love my movement so much, because there's so many different parts of myself, and I feel like I found my home and all of my identities um, as a woman, as a black woman, as a southern black woman, as a southern black woman who identifies as a lesbian. There's everything about my, all of my identities that I found my home in reproductive justice, and so I'm able to work across movements. I'm able to collaborate and build coalitions with folks. Um, uh, in terms of Charlotte, there was an article that just came out about uh, the segregation of Charlotte classrooms and how it's like the, sh the dirty shame of Charlotte that these investigative reports have now come out about um, we, we had issues with busing in the past, but just in terms of the educational disparities that exist in our city and how folks are still being separated across uh, along race. Um, more specifically, I do work in school systems as well, which is a reproductive justice issue um, around the over-medication of children who are diagnosed, the over-medication and the over diagnose or mis misdiagnosis of um, children, specifically children of color, specifically young black boys, right, of, of uh, mental illnesses like ADHD and over-medicating folks and what that does to a developing child. Um, the over-criminalization of our children, um, I stand with my men, you know what I'm saying? Like that's happening in Charlotte to a degree where we're putting babies in handcuffs and I am um, vehemently set against putting our children in handcuffs, that there are no longer um, sort of these, uh, these um, discussions with children about proper behavior. The, the, the initial instinct is to call the police. The police are an ever-growing presence in our schools. And so um, thinking about the psychological impact um, or the long-term impact of you know four and five and six-year-old children who are placed in handcuffs at school, um, research tells us that um, once a person, once a child goes to jail, the incidence or the expectation that that child will go back to jail jumps exponentially just on the experience of having encountered something like that, which is deeply problematic um, for me as a clinical social worker and as a reproductive justice activist. So I'm so excited to jump into a lot of these conversations with folks. I'm excited to meet all of you. Please come and talk to me. Please let's um, connect and swap information um, and continue to build this out together. Thank y'all, thank y'all. We're going to do uh, 10 or 15 minutes worth of Q&A, and, a, and uh, every one of the panelists, we appreciate you being here, even though, you know, I guess you're listening and not watching, but thank you, and uh, y'all should know that uh, one of our scheduled panelists could be here, and about three or four minutes before we went on, I went over and tapped Vince on his shoulder and said, would you mind sitting in? So thank you all. Okay. Um, if this works... All right, that's working. So uh, we just want to do some questions, and if you raise your hands, I'll bring you the mic. Um, anyone want to jump in there? Um, I do. All right, Dan. Yeah, I'd like to direct this question to Robin. 
you made reference to the 13th Amendment of the Constitution about where it, it didn't absolve slavery? There's, there's, in, the language, in the language of the 13th Amendment, there's something called the exception rule. And it relates directly to the school prison pipeline. Um, I can read it, I guess. It looks like a little Bible, doesn't it? Well, we're going into the 14th Amendment, 13th. 13th is all the, it's like 1865. Yeah, yeah. Right there on that page, right there where I'm marking it. Well, well, the, well the, general, the general gist of it is... The general gist is that wherein we thought that uh, with the 13th Amendment, slavery was done away with, if you look... Uh, specifically at the wording, it states with the exception of in, in prison. And so we have a structural system set up to bring youth uh, from youth to adulthood into the prison system, monetizing black bodies, commodifying black bodies. Um, and so the 13th Amendment that clarifies it for me. gives slavery a new name, yeah. and, and it's morphed with the, uh, the prison population. Particularly with prisons for profit now. Well, the prisons for profit, that's a whole other issue. There's a uh, conflict ethically in terms of uh, 80 to 90 percent occupancy requirements in their contracts of our government, and our government's complying by locking up folks and filling in those beds. So there's a, there's a profit incentive in this judicial process. And I also want to mention, while I get the chance, while we focus on the police, um, the issue with uh, the judicial system in general is 95% of prosecutors are white. And so there's some sustenance, so, you know, when you speak of disparate outcomes uh, or disproportionality, uh, you can flip the script on that in terms of law enforcement and the subsequent behaviors of police. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Um, uh, another comment about that, or we have another question? Question back here. Uh, I wanted to add to the points that uh, Robin raised. Um, starting with the last one first. I don't know, maybe I should do CERN first. To say that the U.S. Um, is, um, has been called upon for the, by the United Nations to um, respond in its uh, one year report back, which um, if you'll go to the U.S. Human Rights Network's website, you will see and click on or search the CERN, C-E-R-D, um, work that is being done, you'll get um, update information about what is, um, where the process is. And the United States has submitted its one-year report back, um, which call, called on the United States to begin counting police murders, um, of which, of course, the United States didn't do. And there is a campaign for civil society to join in um, filing um, what are called shadow reports, or supplemental reports, to point out that the United States is failing to do that. So um, I wanted to raise that. The second thing is, is that the fact, the truth of the matter is, with regard to the number of prosecutors there are, it doesn't really matter how many prosecutors there are. Black people thought that if we had more black judges, we had more black lawyers, we had more black police, that it was going to make a difference. The problem is, as Robin started out with, is racism, white supremacy, and the policies that are uh, designed to uh, maintain the global system of white supremacy and um, is the underpinning for the so-called crimes that make, quote unquote, involuntary servitude or slavery uh, permissible in this country. So, I think that we should not get distracted by the notion that if there are only 2% black prosecutors because the black prosecutors all want to be judges and all the judges want to be Supreme Court justices. So they, like Barack Obama, are going to do the things that are necessary to maintain the system um, for their personal aggrandizement and advancement. So the object has to be to dismantle the global system of white supremacy and male domination. So I saw Russell. 
Thank you. Okay, my question is, now if, if people were infiltrated, infiltrated because people don't know each other, now I'm going to ask you all a question then, now the people, if they didn't come with you, the person sitting beside you, have you introduced yourself to them? Have you? That's step one, but I'm going to leave it alone, and uh, thank you. What, what do you think that in terms of that being Well, case? certainly one, um, one way to challenge that is to really get to know people and know who's walking in the door and know if they, if you don't know when they walk in the door, make sure you know when they leave. But one of the um, challenges with entrapment, and if you are someone who watches documentaries or films, you might want to watch the Newberg Sting. Um, this was, this included a gentleman who was arrested, this happens, young African American man arrested, and he was paid to infiltrate and entrap people into saying they wanted to put a bomb on a bridge in Cleveland. And they didn't want to do this, and his role as a paid uh, person to help I'm like, to help entrap people. So he infiltrated with the goal to entrap. And that could happen, that even if the person's nice and seems, you know, very affable and they care about the issue and they're just as passionate as you are, they may be in a situation where they're being forced to do that because of their own legal situation. And I don't have the answers on how to defend on this, but the Bill of Rights Defense Committee and Defending Dissent Foundation will be working on a policy response. Um, Robin's right. One of the ways to address these issues is through local city councils, county commissioners, pass a law that says in this city, our funds are not used for the police to profile anyone. In this city, we are not sharing information with any federal entity. And you can make that law locally, pass it, and then stand by it. And that's the kind of policy that we're going to try to draft. We're going to work with folks who are in the mental health community, folks who are in um, protecting First Amendment activities and other Fourth Amendment activities, and try to find a policy solution to deal with infiltration and entrapment. And we'll share it when we have it, hopefully early next year. Um, I think it's important to look at some of the collaborating um, organizations that are trying to do exactly what you're saying. I'm part of the Southern Movement Assembly, which is a Southern Freedom Movement um, headed by Project South, but we're all in the South. So we just left um, New Orleans, you know, for the 10th anniversary of uh, her, uh, Katrina. But the piece that I'm seeing that's not happening within our movement, right, when we talk about the um, you know, the, the human rights uh, principles that I give out to the youth when I talk about the ACU all card, ACU L ACLU card that I give out to the youth, you know, because no one wants to take their children outside because we live in Florida, you know, what happened to Zimmerman and all. You know, when we talk about those pieces of information, including um, something like the Cahaba Rivers Collective, there is a piece that we're not getting together a lot in our movement. So, you know, one of the things Southern Movement Assembly does is that we're on calls with each other every week, and that's very hard to know in this room who is everyone. Even with us working together for the, the past five years, there is still pieces where, um, you know, we're having trust issues. You know, and why is that? There's many reasons, right? First of all, we would all say, if we look back at COINTELPRO, you know, when we look at Willie Lynch, all these effects. So, so when someone leaves our group as the organizing agencies, from Fannie Lou Hammer to New Jim Crow to Southern Work, uh, Southwest Union Workers, uh, Project South, you know, all of the many groups we have throughout the South, we still have to get on these phone calls and we may be hating on each other on different levels. I ain't gonna lie. You know, sometimes there is that piece. I have right now, and I brought up the Kahamba Rivi Collective statement, there is a piece that happened in the 60s for me, which was the black woman, I'm a woman, right, had issues with women in educational forums because they were grassroots. That still exists right now. I, I just, you know, with doing free members to now, I may have had 38,000 members, but we have issues because we haven't sat together and converged. And so that's what we're saying through the Southern Movement Assembly, is we must converge, meet up more like this, 
you know, and, and continually use that framework of round robin so we hear more of them from everyone as well. I mean, I, I do have to say, you know, that's one of my big things is the convergence is when we get together, how do we allow everyone's voice, including that little boy, thank you for that little, for him coming. I wanted to acknowledge him earlier, but we have to look at the youth. We got to look at who's the elder in the room. I don't know who the elder is in the room today. Of 19 people getting arrested, we're all over probation. We have the Occupy, we have Veterans for Peace, we have Black Lives Matter, we have the Malcolm X Rescue Movement, we have all these groups. And there is no cohesiveness totally because of that infiltration. Right, right. Yes. Amongst us that rallied and have been arrested together. So how do we not go back to what happened with the Black, you know, the um, Black Panthers or any movement? And that means we do have to look at those indigenous and globalized organizations that kept it together strong despite we are in different states. So I do push that we um, look at that, converge more often, but yeah, get to, know, get to know each other here, but meet up more often. And hopefully the blood We'll also be talking about that at our National Assembly next year if we have that, the Black Liberation Front. Um, so, so Hank, uh, did you have a comment? Just a, a response to the gentleman and to invite him to a Black Lives Matter meeting in Asheville where you reside, that'd be appropriate. And, and secondly, there is a lot of hope behind human rights law. Uh, there was a precedent that was set recently in Chicago where they extracted international law to impose a penalty for uh, uh, torture by the police department on victims. I think the award was $5.5 .5 million. But the precedent's important in that they utilize international human rights law <clears throat> in a city council uh, a setting, municipal setting. And so we feel that human rights should be embraced on the local level, uh, bottom up, top down. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Do you have a yes, sir. No. All right, we're running tight. One more question. Well, you need this. Yeah. I didn't see you out there. Thank you. Yeah, I won't take a minute. Uh, we got to remember also, not just uh, Black Lives, well, not just uh, organizations that we get targeted. Young black males get targeted in general, and I know we spoke about that already. DEA go around pay people good salaries to entrap our children. And uh, I know some from a personal level. Ain't seen no drugs, never will see any drugs, sitting up in jail for 10 years because somebody came up to them and said, let's rob the Colombians. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Colombian uh, that was supposed to be having to rob the Colombian worked for the DEA. He was one of our paid staffers. You know, made it good money, got a good house and family at home to go and trap our kids to go to jail. You, you put a young man in a situation where he can't get a job. Uh, he want to be a man too. So he want to have money in his pocket. He want to be able to provide for a family. So when it sounds like it's opportunity, most men take opportunity at risk. You know, that's just natural. So as a uh, as, as citizen of this country, we got to take it upon ourselves to stop our government from entrapping our children. Right. Yeah. Thank you for your patience and like your involvement. And Malefi's going to lead us to the next Okay. All right. Thanks, Coleman. And uh, thank you all. Thank the panel. Um, as the panel walks off, we would also like to give the panel here a chronic mug. Yeah, I'm